Richard Holloway and what I'm going to be saying essentially is that it's best to understand religion as a work of the human imagination, as an art form and not as a quasi-science and if you understand it that way you can see the colour and the creativity in it and there's no point in squabbling over it because over art people have various attitudes and opinions, just let them have as many as they like. I didn't do that, I hope. <laughs> yeah. um, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And you have my permission to have a postprandial kip, if you prefer. Um, you're all well wined and dined. This is not going to be a lecture. I'm not trying to persuade you into or out of anything at all. I've given that up. Um, I don't stay in one place very long myself, so I have no right to try and fix the place that anyone else should establish themselves in. What I want to do tonight, I suppose, is offer a kind of testimony where I am um, in this mysterious business um, that we think of as religion and the ultimate um, nature of meaning, if there is any meaning in the universe. And since I've written... Um, my memoir leaving Alexandria, and I've been going round the place, I've been going up and down on the earth like Satan, because um, there are book festivals all over the world now, and you get a book out and you get invited to them. And almost invariably, I'm asked by at least one or two people in the audience, um, do you still believe in God? And I sigh and say, well, it depends the God you're talking about. Because one of the things that characterizes the story of God is the story of constant revision and abandonment and death and leaving God. There's a lovely passage in Salman Rushdie's, the grand, his novel, The Enchantress of Florence, when the grand Mughal is musing about God and meaning, and Burble replies to him when he accused all believers of being atheists, because they didn't believe in each other's gods, while the true atheist only believed in one god less than the others. <laughs> so there is a sense in which we've all taken leave of God, to quote Don Cupid, or taken leave of certain gods. I was priested in the Scottish church in 1960, and the god of the Scottish church at that time um, believed that you only got one shot at marriage, because marriage created an indissoluble metaphysical bond, and you could only do it once, because you could only be metaphysically bonded once. And so there was no second chance. If you mucked it up, if you had an affair, if your marriage failed, that was it. You were metaphysically welded together in the eyes of God, and when people came to me asking if they could be given a second chance, the answer, my church believed God had given them was, no, you get one shot at it, and if you can't make it work, then tough, you have to practice celibacy, because remarriage after divorce is simply institutionalized adultery. I never really believed in that God, but that was the God that I officially had to um, commit myself to. The God that my church believed in in 1960 taught the subordination of women and the impossibility of women receiving the character of ordination. I was brought up as an Anglo-Catholic. Anglo-Catholics believe that when the bishop laid his hands on you, there was mystically inserted into you a substance called the character of ordination. It was a kind of um, magic ability that you had to conjure the real presence in the Eucharist, the real Jesus in the body and blood, in the bread and wine, and a woman was incapable of receiving that character. There was just no way. If a bishop laid his hands on a woman, it was just a charade. And if you had ordained women, you wouldn't be getting the real Jesus when you went to Mass. And, of course, it gets worse because if you have women bishops, you're not getting real priests at all because a, a woman bishop cannot insert 
the character of ordination into anyone, including a man. So if you start having women bishops, you'll never know when you're getting the real Jesus as you go around the country. You could go, you could go to communion in Blackburn or Brighton, and you wouldn't ever know whether the person up there doing the magic had actually got the right to do it. Superstition. But we were taught to believe in the pipeline theory of grace called the apostolic succession. Uh, and it only came through male hands. It couldn't get through female hands, and so on and so forth. There were many, many examples of that. And, of course, there was absolutely no way that you could even debate the possibility that the God of the Scottish Church might approve of people of the same sex making physical love to each other. That was not even on the cards. If we're honest about God, which is what I've been loosely asked to talk about, we have to accept that the human history of God, and Karen Armstrong wrote a very fat book outlining God's history. God's had a history, and it's a history of constant editing and revising and abandoning. And your church and my church has abandoned the God of the 1960s largely. Not everyone, because there are many people who are still very attached to that way of understanding the nature of God. The only point I'm making at this moment is that the history of God is a history of constant flux and change and abandonment. And we need to be honest about that. And let's go back even further. I was taught um, as a young theology student with a bit of a thing about Kierkegaard that one of the most important lections in the Old Testament was the story of Abraham's almost sacrifice of Isaac. And that this taught a kind of absolute obedience that, that countermanded any human loyalty. And I struggled with that myself as a human being, because I'd hate to have been the wee boy on the altar um, with this, this man, my father, obeying the will of God by sacrificing me. It was a novelist who taught me to see it from Isaac's side. Um, Jenny Diskey's novel, After These Things, she sees it from the point of view of the boy being sacrificed in order for the man to demonstrate his absolute obedience to the God he worshipped. And what Isaac feels is terror. I suspect that behind that story, there is an evolution out of the practice of child sacrifice. Um, and when Christian theology uses that story, it has already cleansed it, turned it into a kind of metaphor for absolute obedience. But I suspect that it's part of the evolution of this change in the history of God that's moving us away from previous understandings into something um, more human, more adaptable, something that we can ourselves more appropriately live with. Now, part of the problem in all of this, lies with the secondary aspect of this whole business of theology and God, which is the claim of revelation, the secondary institutions that claim to reflect and, as it were, mirror the mystery and the meaning and the reality of God. And part of the problem is, of course, is that the revelatory documents are very old, and they tend to reflect the values of the time in which the revelation took place, uh, which is why in John Hick's famous typology of realism, critical realism, and non-realism, he says that there are three attitudes to this. There is the attitude that says there was a real God, there was a real revelation, and we really got it down accurately, and we really have to obey it. Critical realists are people who say there was a real God, there was a real revelation, but we are really screwed up receivers, we humans, so we cannot claim to have received it accurately, and therefore it has to be critically interpreted. And so you're in this constant balance between sifting, as it were, the gold, the enduring essence of that which is revealed, and sifting out the stuff that's adventitious, that's related to the social and cultural arrangements of the time, such as the subordination of women, such as possibly the sacrifice of children. 
And one of the ways in which we have done this is by increasingly asserting our own moral values against the values that claim to have been revealed, which is why Hick's third element in his typology is non-realism, that this is us making up our response to the mystery of the universe in which we are set, into which we have been thrown, which obsesses us. Tillich said that religion was passionately asking the question of the meaning of our existence, because it doesn't come to us. We didn't come into this world with a manual like a new computer telling us what it, what it all means. We came into this world asking questions about the meaning of our own existence, the meaning of the universe itself. That passionately addressed is religion, and there's no one way of doing it. And one of the things that passionate religionists have done is challenge passionately previous understandings of the answers they gave to the questions they asked the universe. Dermot McCullough's got a, a book out, his Gifford Lectures of last year, Silence in Christian History. It's a fascinating book because it's not only about contemplative silence, the silence that waits. It's about the ugly silence of the cover-up, the silence about things not admitted. And he, he talks about the church's silence on slavery. And he said, let me read you what he says about slavery in, in his book, Silence. He says, the distressing fact for modern Christians is that slavery is taken for granted in the Bible, even if it's not always considered to be a good thing, at least for oneself. One would have had to be exceptionally independent-minded and intellectually awkward to face up to the consensus of every philosopher in the ancient world, and the first Christians did not rise to the challenge. Paul's epistle to Philemon, in which the apostle asked his correspondent to allow him the continued services of Philemon's slave Anesimus is a Christian foundation document in the justification of slavery. It took us 1,800 years to get rid of it. And what I didn't know is that the first Christians who challenged it, according to um, McCulloch, um, were Pennsylvanian Quakers of 1688. They were the first in the game to challenge this. And here's McCulloch again. Quakers believed in the prime authority of the inner light. Many of their earliest activists had, through their sharp critique of the problems of the scriptural text, pioneered the modern enlightenment discipline of biblical criticism. The Quakers' disrespect for the established conventions of biblical authority was the reason that they could take a fresh perspective on biblical authority and reject it. It took original minds to kick against the authority of sacred scriptures. What was needed was a prior conviction in one's conscience of the wrongness of slavery, which, might, which one might then decide to justify by a per purposeful re-examination of the Bible. Note those words. What was needed was a prior conviction in one's conscience of the wrongness of slavery. In other words, the Quakers decided slavery is wrong. We know that. If the Bible appears to justify slavery, then the Bible is wrong. And they created, by that moral supremacist approach to Scripture, the beginnings of the scientific critique of Scripture that we all now live and wrestle with. But not completely, because one of the problems that Christians have because of our attachment to this theory of revelation, is that we find it almost impossible to do the right thing for the right reason without a religious justification. We can't just decide that it's absurd not to ordain women. It's unjust to do it. We have to find religious reasons for doing it. I remember when we were debating it in the Scottish church, and you had your own versions in England, um, we, we raided the scripture for texts that might allow us to... To, to ordain women, and we found one, of course, because there's a wee verse in Galatians, remember it? 
In Christ there is neither slave nor free, male nor female, Jew nor Greek. Thank God we breathed a sigh of relief. <laughs> we had scriptural mandate for doing the right thing. And then we started doing it. Unfortunately, Paul didn't add neither gay nor straight, did he? <laughs> Rather than saying, yes, we have learnt the inappropriateness of the, of the subordination of women. We know it is wrong. Our inner light, our inner conscience tells us we have to give ourselves permission, which is one of the reasons. And I, I, I feel affectionate towards the church because it struggles with this. It's struggling with it over the ordination of women. It's struggling with it intensely um, about gay relationships. And you have to respect people who've been taught they've they have, as it were, integrated within their own hearts and minds this idea of authority that doesn't enable them to think something for the first time and move into a new understanding of truth and morality and justice because they are, as it were, held with this pious approach to the tradition. I respect that. I mean, there's something actually quite moving and beautiful about it. There was a headline in a Scottish newspaper not very long ago. Uh, there was a woman standing outside a, a house in the Highlands. She'd been running it as a bed and breakfast place, um, and she refused to allow a couple of gay men to spend the night there, and she got done for it, and so, so she was setting the business because she broke the law, because there happens to be a law that prevents that. And there was a picture of her standing outside. My heart went out to that woman, because I realized she was being faithful to her tradition. And her, her, her tradition had taught her to believe that what these men would have done in that bed was an abomination. Um, a priest friend of mine left me in his will uh, a Victorian plate of the sort that hangs above the bed in cold bed and bedrooms in the Highlands. And it's a, it's, it's a big eye. And underneath it says, Thou God seest me. <laughs> Hanging above a cold bedroom. And so in a sense, you have to respect the loyalty of people to the tradition. And it makes even kind people cruel. Because they're being faithful. And maybe... One of the lessons that we have to learn is a kind of loosening, a kind of lightening up, a kind of understanding that, yes, we, we need our authorities, our institutions, our organizations, our sacred scriptures, our texts, the things that help us understand and interpret and make our way through this muddled existence. But if you hold them too tightly, if you idolatrize them, in fact, if you turn them into God, then you make it impossible to change your mind, certainly quickly, maybe even at all. And it's the most faithful people who find it most difficult to make these changes. And this is the thing that breaks my heart about the debates that we're having, because it's the best in people often. Of course, you've got the people who, who, who are secret haters and who love to have a scriptural text that, that, that gives them permission to do the thing that they deeply, hatefully want to do. But that's not true of most people. Most people are simply imprisoned in a theory, a theory of revelation, a theory of permanence. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could all somehow liberate ourselves from this and saying, it's so uncertain where all this stuff came from. It's full of beauty and truth and mercy and forgiveness. It's also full of ancient attitudes that we should give ourselves permission to pick our way through. One of the things that's most helped me in my own wrestling and struggle uh, with all of this is a theory of art um, that I discovered from um, a philosopher of art called Arthur Danto. He died this week. And Danto said of the human being, we are extraordinary creatures, we human beings. I mean, our minds, our big brains are wrestling with this kind of stuff. Um, whether left, right, or middle, we're all at it. Um, because in us, evolution has gifted us with this intelligence that's a curse and a blessing. Um, that the cows in the field, if there are cows in Derbyshire, they're not doing what we are doing tonight. 
because they're so embedded in nature, they're not asking these questions. But we are, we do it all the time. And Danto said, he did, his term for the human animal was, he said, we were an ens representans, a being that represents the world. Now, let, let's think about that. One of the things that's most characteristic about us is that we're embedded in this world and we represent it. We make paintings of it. We write stories about it. You read, um, Samuel Beckett said of James Joyce that what he, he didn't write about something. When you read James Joyce, you get the thing itself. He represents reality. He's got that mystical, magical ability to get into language what is actually happening in that walk through Dublin in Ulysses. And the great artists do this, which is why they make us pause. You see, yes, you read a great novel, and it's representing you. You look at a picture, even if it's just a cows in a field or a tumble-down bridge, and you're stunned by it. We are the creature that represents the world back to ourselves. And it means that we're not simply material creatures. Danto was very sure about this. He said that if you simply materialize the human animal, you miss its most important function, which is this representative, this ability to create art. And religion is one of our greatest creations. Religion is us representing our search, our struggle to understand, to find meaning, wrestling with the very possibility there may not be meaning, that we are thrust into a universe with a lust for meaning in a universe that has no meaning. That's one of the paradoxes that keeps me on the edge of transcendence. I don't do God very well nowadays, but I find myself poised on this kind of cliff, this, this strange mystery that I am a being who asks questions of the universe. It's taken the universe 16 billion years, but in us, it's asking questions about itself. In us, it's wrestling with the big questions of meaning. But of course, we have this tendency to jump too soon to the permanent answers. And then it slows the whole thing down. And it, it, it says, <laughs> the bus has stopped. It's all been answered. And we know it hasn't, because we know that we go on representing uh, the universe to ourselves constantly. I don't pray much nowadays, not in the way that I used to. I found the leadenness of saying morning and evening prayer, which I did every day for 40 years. I, I can't do that now. But on two occasions recently, I was prompted to a kind of prayer that was poetry rather than prose. Um, I can't do the prose of God but I can do the poiesis of God, the making of God. The word poetry comes from a Greek word for making. And I found myself, I was visiting a former priest in the Diocese of Edinburgh who's been fighting cancer for years. He's lost all his vocal cords. They took his gullet out. He can't speak. He, he speaks on, a, on an, an iPad. Um, he was immensely cheerful, and, and um, we were sitting there gossiping about the Scottish bishops and what a dismal lot they were. It was... It was <laughs> It was all extremely enjoyable. <laughs> and, and before I left, I said, I wanted to pray with him. I wanted to bless him. So I stood up, and I put my hands upon his head, and I, I made poetry over him. I blessed him in the name of the three, I don't believe in the Trinity as a dogma, as a doctrine, but I was, I was pouring the power and grace and strength of the three into that man, and I was making something happen. It was a, it was, it was a work of art. I couldn't have justified it theologically or philosophically, but it was true. It meant something in that situation. And a few weeks later, at the end of High Mass in Old St. Paul's, where I still attend, I saw a clergyman in the congregation I didn't recognize, in a, in a kind of black suit, ah, an Anglo-Catholic, I <laughs> recognized the brand. Um, and just as I was going downstairs for coffee, he came towards me with a man. Um, 
and he said he was a priest in a diocese in England, and his bishop had given him permission to have a civil partnership with this man, but just a civil partnership. Couldn't do any more. Would I bless them? Would I give them a nuptial blessing? And I took them into the Lady Chapel. And I put my hands on them. And I gave them a radical Trinitarian blessing, bonding them together. And tears were pouring down their faces. And I didn't believe in what I was doing, but I was making God present, as it were, as an act of poetry, as an act of representation. I was representing to them and to myself a longing for their unity, for the struggle that had been, the hurt they'd felt, a church that they worked for that somehow rejected them. So I can't argue any of this, but I'm lured into these situations where the ends represent ends, the being that represents, the being that pours its longing into action and poetry and music and beauty somehow makes that mystery present. Very fleetingly, of course, and you can't make a theory out of it, and maybe one of the problems that we're all wrestling with, at least some of us are wrestling with, is that the God that we meet in the theory doesn't do that, doesn't break down and creep up on people. Um, and offer them that, well, you get hints of it. There are, a lot, there are more than hints of it in Jesus, that absolutely insane, unconditional grace and forgiveness and total acceptance of us and our brokenness and fallenness and lostness, and there's no way of actually being worthy of that. You get all that, all the, all the hints of that in this God thing that we're all wrestling with. I've ceased to be able to talk about God, um, to argue for God, um, I get lots of people trying to bring me back to God. I, invari I get one book a week from someone who says, this will sort you. Um, this will really, you know, as if I'd never actually kind of gone through any of that stuff. Um, or, or I even get texts from the Bible, never read the Bible. Um, get all of that kind of stuff. What I'm saying here is that there is something something going on in our culture um, that is seeing religion as somehow no longer opening the way to this poiesis, this poetry of the possibility of ultimate meaning, but somehow shutting a door on it because it says it's all been answered, it's all back here. Two people who've also helped me to hold on to a strange Zen way of doing this are two great... Um, uh, Jews, Paul Salan, the poet, um, who committed suicide like, like Levy, um, he wrote an astonishing poem called Psalm, which, in which the human, the being that represents, is praising nothingness. Because if it is nothingness from which we come, out of that nothingness has come beauty and grace and forgiveness and horror and terror and ugliness. And so he, 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 he praises nothing. Let me read you the poem. No one molds us again out of earth and clay. No one conjures our dust. No one. Praised be your name, no one. For your sake, we shall flower towards you, and nothing we were, are, shall remain flowering. The nothing, the no one's rose, die nichts, die niemand's rose, die nichts. Get, get the harshness of that. That gave us birth with our pistol so bright, our stamen heaven ravaged, our corolla red with the crimson word which we sang over. Oh, over the thorn. And the thorn is the thorn of the need to find meaning, to find beauty in an apparently meaningless universe that came from denix, came from nothing. And we are the being that represents that back to itself. We don't know whether 
We're hearing an echo of that. I can live without it now. Um, I can live with the possibility that what I try to represent, that the art that we create, the things we say back to the world, representing it, painting it, making it, is enough. And all the quarrels that are going on between um, the ultra-godly and the ultra-godless leave me cold, I'm afraid. I find myself in no man's land, in, in Arnold's darkling plain with these armies battled by night. Um, I'm not even very keen on attempts to try and revive the church's ability to communicate meaning because I somehow, I just want the church to shut up for a bit. Um, I, I, just, I just want a period of Sabbath um, for myself, actually. I'm sick and tired of the sound of my own voice, frankly. I'm taking, I'm taking a vow of stability and silence next year um, for that reason, because I've been doing so much of this and we're all talking, we're all chattering E.M. Forster's poor little talkative Christianity. And yet, somehow, these acts of poetry happen, these, the, these blessings, these moments of grace, and they hold us in a strange kind of posture of waiting. R.S. Thomas said, the meaning is in the waiting. Don't jump too quickly to a conclusion. Wait, wait. My other Jew is George Steiner. Amazing man. He's a very ill man now. And in his little memoir, Arata, um, he says something that, that, that you won't understand. Um, don't try to understand it. Try to get the zen of it. Um, let it kind of filter through and, and maybe it will alter a way in which you do, a way in which you represent being. He says, from the unreasoned, unanalyzable, often ruinous all power of love stems the thought that God is not yet. That he will come into being, or more precisely, into manifest reach of human perception only when there is immense excess of love over hatred. Each and every cruelty each and every injustice inflicted on man or beast justifies the findings of atheism insofar as it prevents God from what would indeed be a first coming. But I am unable, even at the worst hours, to abdicate from the belief that the two validating wonders of mortal existence, listen to this, the two validating wonders of mortal existence are love and the invention of the future tense. <laughs> Their conjunction, if it will ever come to pass, is the messianic. When love and the future tense marry, conjunct together, will be the messianic. I don't know what it means. Don't, don't do the meaning thing with it. Don't turn it into a system. Just live, live with the Zen of it, the impossibility of it. Love and the future tense in conjunction. And remember that we humans are the being that represents the world to itself. My wee dog doesn't do it. The cows and the sheep and the field, we do it uniquely. It is our pain, our passion, and our glory. And one of the things that we've invented to do it is religion. See it as a work of art, therefore as something that we, we've created to represent mystery and the possibility that there might be meaning in a universe that scarily might not mean anything. We know this planet's going to die the heat death. We'll all be long gone. Some of us maybe quite soon. I'm getting on. Um, and it will be, it'll become a little cinder. And I sometimes meditate on the fact that in that Cinder's history, there has been Bach and Mozart and Canterbury Cathedral and Tolstoy's War and Peace and innumerable acts of mercy and love and pity and music cascading as well as all the horrors. 
and it will be as if it had never been. And what will it have meant? The being that represented something and then shriveled into a cinder? I don't know, maybe. But it will have been what it will have been. And it will have been something glorious, something extraordinary will have happened through us in this burnt-out universe. And that kind of makes it worthwhile because we, the being that represents the world back to itself, will have imagined and longed for these glories. And even if they never really ultimately existed, it will have been enough to have been gloriously wrong and sordidly right. That's me done. Thank you. Thank you.